The national body rules say that a minimum of 20 laps in a 25 lap race must be finished before the title can be awarded. Last month Queensland driver Julie Vine smashed into a safety fence stopping the final after just 16 laps. Sydney driver Glenn Dobbin was awarded the race, but he'll have to line up again tomorrow night. Also on the card, the Super Sedan Supremos. Curry's John Pine will be keen for some quick times after losing his national title two weeks ago in Bendigo. Up until now, the conflict between the Knights and the Bears has been confined to the field, but the fur could begin to fly at an official level. Newcastle management is none too pleased by the stand Bears president, David Hill, has taken against Premiership sponsor Winfield. And where there's smoke, there's ire. North Sydney Lease Club is not a smoke-free zone to my ideas of things. Now, if he and his committee are a, a, a diametrically opposed to cigarette sponsorship, surely they should clear the club of cigarette smoke because they do sponsor the players. In effect, the players are living to some degree out of the profits of cigarettes. And that's not the only off-field development. Previously, kangaroo prop Mark Sargent was the closest thing the Knights had to a locomotive. But now they may soon have their own train station. Transport Minister Bruce Baird hopes to see the Broadmeadow station become the red and blue centrepiece of the Knights' kingdom, providing the club pays for the paint. The Knights like the idea, but not the cost. I'm absolutely amazed that the government expects a, a football club to paint their railway station. They don't maintain our football ground, they charge us plenty of rent and the maintenance costs involved with the football ground. We certainly in our financial position wouldn't think too, uh, twice about uh, uh, painting the Broadmeadow railway station at our cost. Paul Manson's body was snared in fishing nets off Point Woolston Craft in southern Lake Macquarie yesterday morning. His body was weighted with bricks and his hands had been manacled. Police say he'd only been in the water for a short time. Personal papers still on the body suggested the killers were confident he wouldn't be found. The fisherman's chance find has given homicide detectives a valuable head start on the case. Manson's vehicle, a white Holden utility, was found abandoned in a car park at Lake Macquarie Yacht Club last night. This morning, police spent several hours at the club investigating the possibility that the killers used a vessel at the marina to take him to an isolated stretch of water south of Poolbar Island. Manson still had a British passport. He arrived in Australia last year and started work with the Pioneer Concrete Company in the Hunter where he'd recently taken up an acting management position at Cessnock. A spokesman said there was no indication that Manson was in any trouble. I did speak to him on the Wednesday morning and um uh, we were asking about some fuel for some vehicles and so, and he was okay then. I didn't see any problems with him then. Although it's unofficial, a post-mortem examination of Manson's body is believed to have found the cause of death was asphyxiation, either from being strangled or by drowning after being thrown into the lake. Inquiries are being made in the United Kingdom to establish if Manson had any criminal record. Tom Hilston, NBN News. Stephen Parkinson died shortly after he arrived at the John Hunter Hospital yesterday afternoon. He was the driver of a speedboat which collided head-on with a small runabout on the Mile River, about 10 kilometres north of Tea Gardens. The area is accessible only by boat, and although hundreds of pleasure craft use the waterway, it remains unpatrolled by police. Three other people were also injured in yesterday's crash. If it wasn't for a doctor cruising nearby, the results could have been far worse. 
It took just 20 minutes to fly paramedics to the area, but almost an hour later, after flagging down a passing National Parks boat, they arrived at the accident site. By that time, Mr Parkinson's condition had rapidly deteriorated. Rescue services believe help could have been there quicker if the area's police boat had been operational. Now here's a government that can find $1.5 million for a luxury penthouse for the police minister, but can't find the money to get a to get a boat, a police boat, back onto those crowded riverways at Port Stephens, servicing the public. The police boat has been out of operation for almost two years. Repairs estimated to cost $10,000 are needed to get it back in the water. But countless appeals to the state government by residents and local police have gone ignored. The problem was first highlighted by MBN in January last year, one week after the Naglucas sank drowning five children and just two days after the hi-ho went down killing a 44-year-old woman. It's believed senior constable Jeff Avery of Tea Gardens Police is facing departmental charges for speaking out. A coronial inquiry has been called into Mr Parkinson's death, but the fact remains Police Minister Ted Pickering and Assistant Commissioner Charlie Parsons have made promises in the past to have the boat repaired. This one was made three months ago. State Premier Nick Greiner today said he had no excuse for his government's inaction. Certainly uh, at face value, it would be very hard to find a decent explanation. Jody McKay, MBN News. These are the two people police are trying to find. A 30-year-old man, 180 centimetres tall, with a solid build and short black hair, and a 19-year-old woman, 164 centimetres tall, with a medium build and short hair, now thought to be dyed black. The pair is believed to be driving a metallic blue Suzuki two-door hatch, number plates LFH762. In the days since the discovery of Dominic Paul Manson's body, police have investigated more than 20 unconfirmed sightings of the couple, but all have proved fruitless. Detectives believe they have established a possible motive for the killing, but refuse to say what it is. The hunt for the pair continues. Gavin Carr is revved up and on the road to glory. He believes he has a great chance of winning two national titles this year, and Kawasaki apparently agrees. Carr has been signed to the Australian team and supplied with two bikes, a 250cc production model and this ZZR600 that could well make all the difference in the Super Street Series. It's the first time in the 600 Kawasaki's been raced in Australia, but it's supposedly the quickest, so if anything goes to plan, should hopefully win it. Carr is already at home on the 250 and set an unofficial lap record at Emaru Park earlier this month. A young man in a hurry, he won't be playing the waiting game on his way to the top. You spend oh, two years at that and aim for the Australian Superbike champion and then hopefully a Grand, Grand Prix team will pick you up and then you can't go any further than that. So a few years down the track you'd like to be drilling with the Doans and the Gardeners? Yeah, for sure. And in Tomago, another big project despite the recession, sand miner RZM is midway through a $2 million transformation which will replace 23-year-old plant equipment with the latest computer-operated machines. Assisted by two 40-metre high cranes, workers have spent the past fortnight removing the entire four floors of this plant. When it reopens in two weeks, RZM management believes the company will be better equipped to take on overseas competitors. There have been new mines opened up in uh, South Africa in particular which are flooding the market with uh, lower quality products in uh, large tonnages and that uh, because of its price advantage during these uh, difficult times has uh, given us severe competition for sales. Sales pressure has been so high even the recession failed to stop the development. 
Well, it certainly caused a, a very uh, intense review as to whether we were doing the right thing. But the only way out for us is to uh, more than beat the uh, competitors in terms of quality. The Bucket's Way has claimed another life. At about half past one this afternoon, this Gloucester-bound Mazda 626 collided head-on with a Newcastle-bound Commodore V6. The Mazda's 32-year-old driver, a Gloucester woman, was killed instantly. Her six-year-old daughter escaped with minor head injuries. The Commodore driver, a 61-year-old man, was trapped in the car for two hours before being rushed to hospital with serious head and internal injuries. His 55-year-old wife was airlifted to hospital in a critical condition. Police say they are lucky to be alive. As you can see by the damage, the, uh, it was a very severe impact and I think we're very fortunate at this stage that there weren't more people uh, killed or, or seriously injured. Police believe both cars were travelling at 100 kilometres an hour and say driving conditions were good. It was just before nine o'clock when witnesses say this car drove straight through the T-intersection of Oxford and Hickory Streets, clipped the front of a truck, then smashed into a parked vehicle. The petrol tank of the second car exploded, setting fire to the front of Vanessa Fox's house. Next me I heard a bang and everything was falling off the, um, the cupboard, top of the cupboard and wardrobe and things were just flying everywhere and anything. My son walked in and said, get out of the house, get out of the house. So I just got a ran. Mrs Fox and her son both escaped without injury, but the front yard had become a fireball. Just dived out the back door and ran around the side here to the front. And I just seen the man in the car and um, my first thoughts were, he's dead. But neighbours had reacted quickly. But everybody was trying to get people out of the car. And uh, I just said, because of the flames, and I just said, we'll push it out of the way and we dragged it over there. Firefighters described the rescuers' actions as heroic. I'm very brave. They, they had the, uh, the car was well alight and they uh, all pinched in, about five or six of them, they were pushing the car out of the way. So this fellow was very lucky, actually. The driver, a 78-year-old Windale man, was taken to the John Hunter Hospital with minor injuries. The female passenger suffered burns and lacerations. Her 12-year-old son, who was thought to be recovering from recent heart surgery, was also admitted to the hospital for observation. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. From water you wouldn't wash your dog in to the perfect drop. You gave enough to drink that? Yeah, well, we designed the product and we built it, Peter, so here goes. Mm. How's that? Pure H2O. Pure water products at Lemon Tree Passage began 10 years ago with a two man operation and a new concept. In 1991, the company employs 28 staff, selling up to 3,000 water purifiers a week. This week, the Water Guard received the Australian Design Award for Excellence. Water runs through a series of filters inside the system, including a special granulated carbon which retains pesticides and herbicides, and also a metal compound which retains harmful chemicals such as mercury. A smaller purifier can be used when travelling. The Water Guard is sold to 26 different nations around the world. A booming new market for the company is post-war Kuwait. Oil spills and fallout from oil well fires have polluted ground and surface water, creating major hygiene and health problems. We've got some Saudi buyers coming out uh, in a week's time and they're looking at, a, at their first order for over a half a million dollars worth of product. 75% of the purifiers are sold overseas, but according to the company, the $695 product is becoming more popular in the Hunter, as consumers expect cleaner, pollutant-free water.
Hundreds of people, many of them elderly, flocked to the Tookley Lions Park to tell the government exactly what they thought of plans to relocate the town's 11 paramedics. They shouldn't be moved because the 20 minutes longer it takes is, could be life-threatening for them or their families. I think it's wrong. They're the elderly people, they pay their taxes, they pay everything all their life and they've got to put up with this rubbish. Ambulance officers admit it will take them up to 15 minutes to reach Tookley from the new Bateau Bay station and locals say that's too long. I uh, suffered a heart attack and my wife called the ambulance and uh, the ambulance men came in and put all the gear on me and they said to my wife, lucky you called the ambulance because of five minutes after that you wouldn't need to call them again because I would have been, would, would have been gone. The paramedics themselves were heckled when they tried to address the crowd. They insist the move is a logical one. Logistically, from Batter Bay we can service a larger population of people, both up here to the south of Batter Bay and also to the west of Batter Bay. It would be a better position for the whole community, not just a small group of the community. Organisers eventually pulled the plug on the paramedics, but still claimed a moral victory. I think certainly, I think this rally again indicates people power is alive and well. I think this rally has got to echo down the corridors. People have got to listen. Politicians most definitely have got to listen. And uh, we, uh, we feel we've got a victory here today. Bruce McKenzie, NBN News. Each year, thousands of people move to the central coast searching for a slice of the good life. But like moths attracted to a flame, some get burnt. It's the high unemployment rate, that's one of the biggest factors that we find here. Um, there is not a great deal of industry on the central coast. And if you have commitments, just normal commitments that you've met all your life, um, it's not easy when you go back if you drop 150 to $200 a week. Smith family records show a disturbing trend. Last month, the Central Coast branch conducted 422 office interviews, more than Wollongong, Canberra or Newcastle. Doubly disturbing is the fact that the Central Coast's population is by far the smallest of all those areas. The shelves at the Gosford Centre have never been so bare. People who once donated are now looking for help themselves. It's very difficult both sides of the coin. We have more and more people coming towards us. We have more and more people with more problems and we are finding it harder and harder to raise the money to cope with it. Dogs weren't much use. Thieves took just minutes to ransack the Adamstown Bowling Club. Police and security guards answering an alarm call to the premises at about 11 o'clock found the front window smashed and the office, kitchen and bar areas rifled. Detectives say the thieves made off with several hundred dollars and they've advised other clubs to avoid the same fate by taking steps to secure holiday takings. A number of club robberies have taken place in the Hunter over previous weeks and they say the Easter season provides tempting opportunities to would-be thieves. Inquiries are continuing. For the past four years, rain has fallen on some of the brightest stars on the golfing map. 216 starters will play this year's Shell International Tournament over 72 holes, giving the youngsters aged from 11 to 17 the chance to play under rigid championship format. 
And for the former great player, Jack Newton, the talent just gets better each year. I was looking through the field there earlier and I think there's something like 74 players on a handicap of four or less, which is pretty uh, outstanding uh, talent when you consider that all these kids are uh, 17 years and younger. It all started way back in 1979 when Newton funded the tournament himself and his dream of an Australian event has materialised to the point where balloting takes place for spots in the field. The success of the Junior Classic speaks for itself. You look back uh, over the last, well this is our seventh one over the last six years and see where some of the talent that's played here has gone. You know, kids like Nicole Lewin who's now a very successful uh, uh, lady professional in Japan, you've got Wendy Doolan and uh, Sarah Gautry who both represented Australia, Stuart Bouvier who won here and then won Australian Junior followed by an Australian Senior Amateur title uh, and I think there was three or four other Australian representatives at junior level, uh, you know it's great stuff. The tournament continues until Tuesday with the final 18 holes being played. One hundred and sixty five competitors from all states and territories of Australia are taking part in the national titles, and on show are most of the skiers from the recent Oski tournament at Raymond Terrace. The states are competing for the Bain and Shield, and a short time ago New South Wales were just leading the favourites and defending champions Victoria by a few points. Records are also tumbling, with disabled skier Jeff Burgess breaking the world disabled jumps record. Jeff leapt thirty eight point four metres and has qualified for the senior men's open jump tomorrow. David Cordius broke the Victorian jumps record with a leap of 44 metres, while Jody Skipper broke the Victorian women's slalom record with a half a boy at 38 off. Mick and Bruce Neville will be hard to beat in the men's slalom and the jumps events. At the Belmont 16 foot sailing club this afternoon and tonight, the New South Wales Country Bodybuilding Championships are being held. The auditorium strained under the combined mass of magnificent muscle as competitors grimaced in putting on their best for the judges. Months of preparation has gone into the titles, with entrants fine-tuning their bodies in the gym and bulking up on carbohydrates the last couple of days. The finals are on tonight. 